I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Economics Department, the Interdisciplinary Program in Neuroscience, the Interdisciplinary Program in Cognitive Science, the McDonough School of Business, the Psychology Department, and the Georgetown University Lecture Fund. I am extremely honored to introduce Professor Glimsher today, someone who has built bridges across the canyon that lies between the disciplines of neuroscience and economics. These bridges have paved the way for the emerging field of neuroeconomics. Dr. Glimsher received his bachelor's in neuroscience from Princeton University in 1983 and his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania in 1989. His first four publications, all as first author, were based on research he conducted as an undergraduate on the rewarding effects of neuropeptides on the brain. He then went to the University of Pennsylvania where he studied eye movement physiology for his PhD thesis. He joined the faculty in neural science at NYU in 1994, continuing his studies on eye movements. His research then moved into studying reward, value, and choice behavior. He currently is professor of neuroscience, economics, and psychology, and the director of the Center of Neuroeconomics at NYU. Amongst his many honors, he has been a McKnight Scholar, a Klingenstein Foundation Fellow, and a McDonnell Foundation 21st Century Scholar. In 2004, he founded the Society for Neuroeconomics <laughs> to catalyze research at the interface of neuroscience, psychology, and economics. He will share his own research in neuroeconomics with us today. Please join me in a warm welcome for Professor Paul Glimsher. Thank you, Justine. Can you all hear me in the back? So before I begin today, I want to thank you for inviting me to this very eclectic and broad audience. Um, this is kind of the worst thing that can happen to a neuroeconomist. People expecting a lot from many different disciplines all at the same time. To help me do the best I can, I want to ask you to tell me what your disciplines are. So I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Uh, I know Justine's worried that I have not actually triggered my talk. I can tell, I can see it in her face. Hang on. Okay, I'm going to ask you to commit to a discipline. You can only pick one. Even I would only pick one. I don't know which one I would pick. Um, if you think of yourself, and the choices will be neuroscientist, psychologist, economist, or finance person. Uh, neuroscientist, psychologist, economics. Oh, this is really bad news. Uh, finance person. OK. Um, so I'll do my best. Please stop me as I go if I say something that makes absolutely no sense to your discipline. I will be doing my best to speak all four languages simultaneously, it's giving new meaning to the notion of speaking in tongues. My, my plan today is to break the talk into three parts. Uh, in the first part, It'll be easy because what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of lay out the logic of what neuroeconomics is, why I think it's important, and how it's grown in the last decade and a half. In the second uh, portion of the talk, what I'll do is lay out what's becoming the standard model of the human choice architecture. Many labs have participated in the development of this model. I'll describe my lab's contribution to it or some of my lab's contribution to it. The critical idea I want to get across is just what we know about the architecture for choice how that maps onto standard neurobiological, economic, and psychological theories. And in the last step, I'll show an example of what neuroeconomics can really do when you bring these together. I'll show an example of basic neurophysiological research in choice cortex, what it tells us about the representational structure of value, choice, and utility, and then make a novel prediction for a choice anomaly in humans and monkeys and show you that it actually exists, as revealed by an understanding of the computational algorithm in choice cortex. OK, but first, I want to go and present this, this rationale. You know, as, as a number of very famous economists have said to me, famously, George, uh, uh, Bob Lucas once turned to me and said, why neuroeconomics? And I want to explain why neuroeconomics. I want to explain it in two steps. First, I want to explain that over the course of the last 100, 150 years, there's been a tremendous reconciliation across many different levels of scientific analysis. If I can point at this, I can't really. At the bottom of this chart is a little map 
that I've labeled physics. And on it, I'm showing you some of the basic logical objects a physicist would be comfortable with. An electron, an orbit, uh, an electric field, things like that. These are the logical constructs from which physics is built. Lying above it is a different level of analysis, chemistry, which has things like molecules and transparency, periodic tables. These are the logical objects from which chemistry is built. And lying above it, the logical objects of biology, things like genes, things like heredity, things like organs. Of course, in the 1800s, these were fully separate areas. There was nothing about these areas that went together. People were one or the other or the other. Now, that began to change over the course of the early 1900s when first physics and chemistry were largely united through the development of the wave equations by Schrodinger and his colleagues. The development of the wave equations made it possible to look at objects within the domain of chemistry through the lens of the wave equations at the level of physics. And physical chemistry, a particular sub-branch of it that unites those two disciplines, grew up. Now, it's important to remember that those two disciplines still exist. The disciplines didn't go away. But the two disciplines were deeply and irrevocably changed. They were changed because we could check ideas in physics at the level of chemistry and import constraints from physics to chemistry and vice versa. The physics and chemistry we have today are very different from the physics and chemistry that existed before the wave equations were developed. There's no doubt about this that they're stronger, they're richer, and that they're more predictive. That happened again at the interface of chemistry and biology with the development of the discovery of DNA. When Watson and Crick first discovered DNA and argued that this chemical object was the physical instantiation of the biological notion of the gene, many people responded by saying that's interesting, but it's irrelevant to biology. When Watson was considered for tenure in the Harvard Biology Department, many argued that what he did simply wasn't biology that never would the theory of heredity be influenced by an understanding of genes. Of course, we know that's true now. And so the challenge is to ask whether or not we can achieve that kind of intra-level communication and dialogue when we try to bridge psychology, neuroscience, and economics in the study of human decision making. The argument I'll make to you today is not only is that in principle possible, but it is well underway and that we have fundamental insights that will serve the same role that the wave equations did, that will bridge together these three disciplines and make each of them stronger, not eliminate any of them, but make each of them stronger. Now, to make that point, I want us to think about a, a storybook decision. I want us to look at it from the point of view of an economist, a psychologist, and a neuroscientist to make it clear to you how different these three disciplines are, how non-overlapping their set of logical objects are, and what a weakness that is. OK, so let me tell this story. I apologize to the graduate students in the lab, in the, in the room. OK, so here's the story. Two graduate students go to a conference. They meet at the meeting. Now, it's important that you know that the two graduate students are both uh, have partners. They love their partners. They're happy with their partners. They're thinking about staying with their partners forever. And they meet each other at a conference. They find themselves talking about utility theory or dopamine or uh, attribution theory, they, they discover an instant chemistry, and then they have to make a decision that night about whether or not they're going to wind up in each other's rooms. And for the purposes of our story, let's assume that these two graduate students spend the night together. In the morning, they're miserable, racked with guilt, dissatisfaction, unhappiness. They return home to their relationships, complete basket cases. They recover. They meet again the next year at the next conference. This is an important point for the economists, and they do it again. How do we think about that, the decisions they made? Well, for an economist, the answer is simple. For the last 100 years, even more, a critical feature of economic thought is what we care about is what we can measure, what we can see, what are observed variables. People reveal their preferences by their choices. These two people revealed their preferences. Was it a mistake? Well, there's some notions of mistake in economics, but these guys did it twice. <laughs> So in no meaningful sense can an economist think that what these people did was make a mistake. They preferred to sleep with this person than to not to, and that's the basic story from which we'll extract their preference structure. A psychologist looks at a very different group of statements by these people. 
They ask, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What does it make you feel like now? What were your perceptions at the time? How are those perceptions changed? These are internal mental state variables. And a psychologist struggles to understand how it is that they made this mistake. How it is that their mental life is at such dissonance with their behavior, and how we can help them bring those two into alignment. The fact that they slept together is kind of the least interesting part. A neurobiologist might say, might say a lot of things, but let's focus for the moment on the idea that a neurobiologist sees this behavior as entirely coherent. Looking through the lens of evolutionary theory, what have these two people done? They've maximized their behavior, their long-term evolutionary fitness by having relationships with people who have different genetic patterns. For the woman, this ensures that her progeny have the broadest possible distribution of genetic background. And for the man, this ensures that he has the maximum number of progeny. I want you to notice that nothing in this story talks about revealed preferences. Nothing in this story talks about mental states. What's interesting about these three disciplines is that they give us such different answers to the notion of why people make the decisions they do. What I want to urge you to do is think about the problems of modeling behavior at a lot of different levels simultaneously. Down here at the bottom of my little cartoon here of different levels of analysis is physics, chemistry, and now biology. Biology is, of course, the level at which we begin to model decision making in a meaningful way. And I think of these as kind of being the level at which Sherrington's insights, on which really modern neuroscience are founded, lay. Above that, of course, is the level of psychology, where people like Pavlov and Weber and Fechner and Stevens worked. And above that, of course, the level of economics, where, well, people like Samuelson have worked. And what we're really going to be asking is whether or not there isn't some way to stitch these top three levels together in a deep way that strengthens all three levels, that aligns those theories in a way that makes them more predictive and more powerful. Now, we have this one problem. Believe me, for me, it's a really big problem. And that is that the social natural science boundary lies between here the level of, of uh, psychology and the level of economics. At a university setting, this is a particularly big deal because there, there's a different dean for here and for here. <laughs> So we're trying not just to reconcile knowledge, but reconcile deans. And those of you who are my age know that that's hard. Um, but I want to stress that reductions of this type have succeeded before. In fact, they've always succeeded. Partial reductions of this type just have always worked. The relationship between physics and chemistry, it's a fact now. We use it every day in chemical and physical labs across campuses across the world. And there's no arguing that Watson and Crick's demonstration that this molecule DNA was the physical evidence, the physical object of heredity, changed the way biology works. And what I'm arguing to you today is that these interdisciplinary linkages are going to show up in the next 20 or 30 years as we propagate up this chain. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong direction. As we propagate up this chain. There's no doubt about it. And I'm show you evidence of it today. But it's just flying in the face of history to imagine this is an unavoidable, this is an avoidable outcome. OK, so what I want to do now is give you a quick overview of how ideas of decision making evolved in the last 50 years or so very quickly, maybe even the last 300 years, in neuroscience and in economics, because it'll be obvious then how you'd put them together. Of course, the critical insight for thinking about decision making, behavior, organization of behavior of any kind for biologists is Rene Descartes. Descartes argued fundamentally 350 years ago that physiologists could study behavior. And the way they would do it was by breaking behavior into two categories. The simple category, which we now call reflexes because he used the French verb réfléchir, and the complex category that were voluntary and were the product of the human soul. It was the first of these two that he argued scientists could meaningfully study. And he argued that the way we would meaningfully study them was by tracing a pathway by which sensory information enters the nervous system, is filtered or reflected, and then passes out to produce movement. In this famous cartoon from his Treatise on Man, Descartes explains to us with what he imagines is a Euclidean style proof that the fire A contacts foot B, 
that these rapidly moving particles of fire joggle a little sensor on the bottom of B, which pulls, open a little, pulls on a little wire, running through this tube C, which opens a pneumatic valve. The pneuma travels back through this pipe, activates this muscle, and draws the foot away. Arcane and Greek sounding in some ways, but the critical idea, this notion that we understand action by following input and connection to output really is the core of the way neuroscientists have thought about the generation of behavior. The person who codified that, those of you who are neurobiologists know, was this guy, Charles Scott Sherrington, who won the Nobel Prize in the 1940s. Sherrington laid out in anatomical terms the Cartesian reflex. He showed how sensors in the foot gather information, pass it to the spinal cord, make positive connections to motor neurons which activate muscles, and draw feet away from fire. And of course, he studied much more complicated behaviors than that. But he clearly established that the neurobiological tradition is one of tracing pathways, tracing connections. That's how behavioral organization is studied by neurobiologists. And what I want to stress to you is how different, during the same timeline, the study of choice is from the point of view of an economist. I could start with the work of Pascal, a rough contemporary of Descartes, who really laid the foundation for modern economics. But instead, I'm just going to cut to the most interesting and more recent version of, of economics, a brand of economics called neoclassical economics, which was really inst instantiated in the early 1900s, around the time of the wave equations, and reached its first full bloom at the hands of this guy, Paul Samuelson, who many of you have heard of. Now, Samuelson won the Nobel Prize for urging economists to focus on what they could observe and on what's called in economics consistency. Samuelson's critical notion was that in understanding choice, the first thing we have to look for is to determine whether a chooser is behaving in a logically consistent manner. Now, we use the word rational to describe this logically consistent behavior. That's actually a technical term for an economist, which is a terrible historical error. It should have been called, you know, schmugus nuv or something. Uh, because rational actually has a common meaning, and often these common and technical meanings are at war with each other, and this leads to endless confusion. But what I want to do is I want to explain to you Samuelson's insight, because it's really critical if you're not an economist, that you understand the primitive, that l most basic object that an economist thinks about. Okay, so imagine this experiment. Um, let's see, uh, this is an experiment I'm going to do on Karen. And uh, I imagine that Karen has the following preference structure. She prefers apples to oranges, great. She prefers oranges to pears, great. This implies, of course, that she prefers apples to pears. That should be obvious. Now, if Karen's inconsistent in her preferences, this might be her preference structure. She might prefer apples to oranges and oranges to pears, but prefer pears to apples. For an economist, this is a truly terrible, irrational, awful thing to do. <laughs> and anybody who feels this way should just either be retrained or shipped out. And they're right, and here's why. So imagine this experiment. So here, we're going to make this. These are actually modeled after two members of my lab, but this is kind of fun. So, um, <laughs> So this is, um, this is Karen, and this is Justine. So Karen's got a, a pear, and she's got three cents. Justine walks up to her and says, I have an orange. Would you like to sell that? Would you like to buy that? I'll sell you this orange if you give me a pear. Well, Karen looks, I prefer, or I prefer oranges to pears, so that's a good deal. But Justine says, you have to pay me one cent. It's a better deal, but I want something for this. So Karen says, great, that's a great deal. Now I have an orange. I have only two cents, but the orange is better. I've traded up. And Justine now has that pair. So Justine comes back to her. She says, well, since that worked out so well for us, what would you say to this apple? I'll sell you this apple for your pair plus one cent. Karen consults her internal preferences. I prefer apples to oranges. <coughs> apples to oranges. It's a good deal. She makes the trade. Now she has this nice apple and only one cent, and Justine the orange. Now remember, Karen's inconsistent in her preferences, which means Justine can whip out the original piece of fruit 
this pear that you got from Karen and offer it to her for one cent and the apple. <laughs> of course, Karen then takes the pear. She's now got no money. But she feels very well treated, even though she's now holding on to her original pear. And of course, if she hasn't figured out what's happened, Justine takes all of her money. <laughs> now, I, I stress this because this is a really core idea in economics. Anybody who holds these preferences isn't making any sense. And all of economic theory is built on asking, what are the representations that would be required in order to produce consistent choice? What would your internal representations of value, I'm going to put internal in italics. For an economist, that doesn't mean it's inside you, just internal to the theory. Representations of value necessary to avoid situations like this. Samuelson won the Nobel Prize for showing what those internal representations would have to look like. He showed that for a chooser who behaves consistently, the internal representation of value has to be monotonic with regard to number of oranges, number of apples, and number of pears, weakly monotonic in technical econ speak. Uh, and that's a really, really big accomplishment because he tells us something about what's going on inside the theory of representation when a chooser behaves consistently. Now, that's a series of ideas that have been expanded upon many times. Most importantly, probably by, by von Neumann and Morgenstern, they actually showed what the internal representations would have to look like when choosers faced not just objects of different values, but probabilistic events. They were actually able to show, using a set of very beautiful axioms, that choosers who are consistent with regard to probability, who treat a 50% chance of something as half as good as a 100% chance of that same thing, that these choosers would have to have a richer and more interesting kind of internal representation of value, again, internal to the theory, and this internal representation has really come to be called utility. So for an economist thinking about choice, we think about goods as having values, internal, subjective, idiosyncratic values, but that are consistent. We think essentially about those values as being multiplied by the probabilities that you'll receive those goods. So if I asked you to choose, between an apple, which was of value 3 to you, but you'd only receive it with a 50-50 chance, and an orange, which was of value 2 to you, which you'd receive with an 80% chance, you might well pick the orange. This would reflect the higher value that aggregates value and probability. This is, what, this is a decision variable in a general sense, but the one that we usually call expected utility. Ex utility because it's value. And the mixture of probability let, lets us use the word expected, because we don't really know what's going to happen. OK, so here's the critical question. You've got this theory of pathways. You've got this theory of values. The obvious question is, how do you push these two things together? The obvious way to begin would be to imagine, well, here's our economics level representation. Here's utility. Here's choice. Utility, as the economists know, is derived from observations of choice. And we imagine this operator, this mathematical operator called the argmax, pick the best, which lies between the utilities of the different goods we compare and the good that we actually select. What we want to explore is the possibility that there's a similar process going on at the neurobiological level. That the representational theory that says this is the best way to produce consistent choice also tells us what lies down at the neurobiological level. And we actually use the word here, subjective value. I'll mention it a few times, because there are important mathematical differences between the measurements we make neurobiologically and the choice-derived theoretical objects, like utility, that we construct as economists. And we respect that by not calling this object down here utility, but rather subjective value. And in fact, we argue that these two, I'll show you in a bit, are linearly correlated. That's a very strong claim, but it's what the data seems to suggest. Choice, of course, we think of as isomorphic to action in the neurobiological construct. And so what we really want to do is ask whether or not we can build a representation like this at the neurobiological level. Let me pause here for the economist. This is one of my, this says on the top, you can't read it, sidebar for economists. Any good economist is now angry, I hope, in the room. Because I had done something really terrible. Consistent choosers behave as if they represented a monotone utility function. That's, you, you get that with your mother's milk as an economist, literally. Um, 
And you would never go past this word as if. And I am, I am proposing now a new kind of theory, okay? This is not a traditional economic theory. This is what we call a because theory. We hypothesize that consistent choosers behave the way they do because they actually represent a monotone variable, what we call SV of x, in some discrete brain area. Okay? For the economist, I want to be really clear that means this theory can be tested at the behavioral level or at the physiologic level. It can be falsified at either level. It's critically a theory that maps between levels. It is different from traditional utility theory. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, I think the first effort to do that is probably this experiment by Michael Platt, an old postdoc of mine, now the director of the Institute for Neurosciences at Duke University. In Michael's first experiment, what he did is he took a monkey, he was recording from a single neuron in the parietal cortex that we had reason to believe was involved in the decision to look in this cartoon 10 degrees to the right. So the monkey's gonna choose where to look, that's easier than having him push buttons for purely technical reasons. And we're going to look at neurons that seem to be involved in something about looking to the right. Now, if we were tracing pathways, I'd tell you that these neurons receive input from the visual world and produce outputs that control movements of the eyes. They lie about halfway down that process. If I was trying to be a neuroeconomist, I might hypothesize that these neurons lying halfway down the process might, in fact, represent in their action potential firing rates, the utilities, or let me say that properly, the subjective values of the options the animals were considering. So in this experiment, what Michael did was basically train the monkeys to play a game of roulette. Two targets were illuminated, one red, one green. After a variable delay, the fixation light with probability 50-50 turned either red or green. If it turned red, the monkey looked at the red. If it turned green, the monkey looked at the green. I'm gonna show you only the red trials. Why? because they have all the same sensory input and all the same motor output. Nothing's different about them. Now, across blocks of trials, what Michael varied was the amount of reward for the red target and the amount of reward for the green target. In the first block of 100 trials, the monkey might get 3 tenths for looking at the red target. In the second, 4 tenths, I should have said, of a milliliter of berry berry fruit juice, which monkeys truly love. This is a really good consumer good for monkeys. 0.3 uh, milliliters of berry berry fruit juice, 0.4 or point two. And what Michael's simply going to ask is, the same pathway is active. It's the same sensory to motor path. But the value's changing. Do the neurons know that? And of course, the answer is yes. Here, what I'm plotting for you is the average activity of a single nerve cell in blue when the monkey's going to look at the red target and expects a small reward, and in red when the monkey's going to look at that red target but expects a large reward. In fact, Michael ran many, many different reward magnitudes on each neuron. What I'm showing you here is a cartoon of that. Imagine there are seven of these lines. We can cut out a slot of time and ask how firing rate varies as a function of expected reward magnitude. Here I'm plotting that for you. Firing rate, this is actually the ratio of values. And what I want you to see is that there's a pretty, pretty linear looking relationship and I want to stress that this is the entire dynamic coding range of this class of neuron. These are cortical neurons. Their dynamic range is about 0 to 100 hertz. So this isn't something that's having a little effect on this neuron. Of course, Michael recognized that if we were thinking a bit like economists and thinking about expected utility type problems, we ought to be able to vary the probability as well. And he did that. Here what Michael varied was the probability that the red target would be the reinforced target. Here 50%, here 80%, here 20%. And of course Michael got the same result. And here you can see all five time periods, but this is the only one that's really important. Okay, so great. What Michael's experiment suggested was that individual neurons that lie halfway between sensory and motor represent something like subjective value, something like utility. And they imply that there's some interaction amongst this representation that is involved in the process of making a choice. To think about that, let's take a look at what this cortical area looks like and how we can think about it more in a more detailed fashion. And to do that, I need to remind you of the human brain. So this is a slide I stole from David Van Essen. And 
This is a human brain. What David's uh, lab is going to do is, using a computer, inflate the brain. And I want to reveal to you what all the neurobiologists know, that brains are basically flat. Cortex is a flat, sheet-like structure. David makes just a few cuts, and we flatten it out. And so when we look at a subdomain of cortex, like the lateral intraparietal area where Michael was recording, right up here, we're actually looking at a planar sheet of material. Now it turns out that these sheets of neurons are organized in a really, really precise fashion. We spent a few years beating on that organization in parietal area LIPs equivalent in humans, something we call IPS1. But you know what? This graph is unreadable. And um, I slowly learned that. My competitor, Marty Serino, did a much better job of exactly the same experiment. And so I'm going to show you Marty's experiment because it's like I don't have to do Fourier analysis or anything. So what, what's happening is human subjects are making a decision about which eye movement they want to make. They're doing it in random order, but for our purposes, let's imagine they're looking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth around the clock, tracking this little spot as they look out, choose to look at it at different times. What you're looking at here is the flattened LIP equivalent on the right side and the left side of one person's brain. And what I want you to see is as the dot sweeps up, this band of activation sweeps out here. And as the dot sweeps down on this side, the band of activation sweeps down on this side. What does this reveal to us? This reveals that these sheets of cortex encode in a topographic map-like fashion each of the eye movements. A neuron right here likes a tender, something about a 10 degree rightward movement. And Michael's data says that what it, what it actually encodes is not like, but utility or something like utility. So the idea then becomes that what we're looking at is a topographic map of utility space. So here I'm going to show you that. Now this is based on lots of other experiments. This is the work of one of the economists in my labs. He's a random utility theorist by the name of Ryan Webb. And what Ryan's built for you here is a simulation of what LIP might look like if you could stand above it and look down on it. Now this is about 100 neuron by 500 neuron sheet. Real LIP is a lot bigger. Each vertex on this surface is one neuron, and the height in a moment is the firing rate of that neuron. This is the display the monkey's looking at. I'm going to light up a target right there in a moment. This is a timeline. This gray bar indicates where we are. And this is the value of this target as it appears and disappears. These are all measurements we've made, so there's no subtlety here. This is just a brute force demo. Yeah, good. This is just a brute force demonstration of that. And you can see a group of neurons over here become active. One is active the most. This is the guy who likes 10 degree movements the most. His neighbors are a little bit active. There's a sort of spreading of activity. And the height of this activity has to do with the expected utility or expected subjective value of this 10 degree rightward movement. OK, if that's true, and we, we're pretty certain at this point that it is, this is what we'd expect to see if we offered two options of equal value, two points of activity on this decisional map, each of which have equal heights. Straightforward enough, I think. What happens if we offer a monkey a choice between two options having different values? Well, we'd expect to see one peak be much taller than the other. It's the relative heights of these peaks which are carrying information about value, and it's their location which is identifying, if you like, the choice set elements. Now, how do we choose? Well, here we have a little bit less data. We have a lot of beautiful models and lots of data from different labs that seems to confirm the general features of these models. It appears that what happens is that every point on these maps is connected with every other point in an inhibitory fashion so that these neurons essentially send out an inhibitory signal across the rest of the map which tries to keep all the other neurons from firing. The neurons at this location are doing the same thing. As we turn up the global inhibitory interaction across the network, the peaks begin, in essence, to compete. Let me show you that again. Oop. No, 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 don't do that. The peaks begin to compete. 
you'll see here is when we turn up the inhibitory connections, this peak effectively suppresses that one because it's stronger. And the result is a choice. This is quite simply the neurobiological instantiation of the economist's argmax operation. And I think there's widespread agreement that this basic mechanism is, is in use in the brain in a lot of ways. It's usually called a winner-take-all mechanism, although there's some debate about whether it relies principally on excitatory or inhibitory connections. If you're a neuro geek like me in my neuro life, that's a really important thing, but not, not for today. Now let me stress that I've told you a story about LIP, but we have every reason to believe this is a broadly distributed process. For the control of eye movements, there are at least three critical areas. The lateral intraparietal area, the frontal eye fields, and the superior colliculus. And we have really strong reason to believe that these areas are reciprocally interconnected. That means that if I inject a value signal here in area LIP, it propagates out to the other areas. And if I increase the inhibitory network strength in any one of these areas, it forces convergence to a single movement in all of them. You can see that here in this cartoon. You'll see the value signal first entrant at LIP, and it propagates through the network to the frontal eye fields and the colliculus. And then in this next step, there the inhibitory burst, which propagates through the network, and then passes through a nonlinear thresholding filter that's very well understood in the colliculus which ends with the generation of the selected movement. <laughs> okay, so the story is actually very simple. And it's the obvious and direct union of the stories I've told you so far. There is a direct pathway that connects sensory to motor. Lying along it are representations of the things you're thinking of getting. But the firing rates along those pathways are something like the utilities. And the process of choosing is using a local mechanism to identify the highest peak and thus select the most desirable of the options. It's actually not that odd an idea, and it really mates these two disciplines nicely. Let me stress that there aren't a lot of new insights here, here other than understanding the mechanism. Now, that's only going to be half the story, and it's going to be clear why in a moment. This cluster of parietal and frontal areas, this is actually for the reach choice system, that I've been talking about right now, these three areas, they are critical in representing the values of the ear options and choosing the one that has the highest value. Of course, the process of really making a choice also requires that we store the values of everything we ever encounter, that we have the ability to learn about new things, that we have genetically and environmentally determined preferences that are stable over long periods of time. And this calls for a large network of areas to participate in a very, very complicated way in the storage, learning, and representation of value. We think of this network as then passing those signals out to the choice network. And it passes those signals out, we're pretty sure at this stage, there are about 50 papers on this, through this brain area, the medial, ventromedial prefrontal cortex. It seems to be the final point in the valuation network before passage to the choice network. But I want to show you just a tiny bit about this, because if I was sitting in the audience and an economist, I would be more than a little distraught at this point, because these are a lot of claims with very little data to support them other than me pointing at a lot of old papers. The critical idea here is that in these valuation circuits, there's a representation of the value of each of the options you might encounter that guides you through this take the greatest activity process in your selection. That's real different from utility. Utility, you can see my little arrows here, utility really is produced by choice. We derive utility from choice as economists. Subjective value is different. Subjective value produces choice. It's causally responsible for choice in the theory. If that's true, I ought to be able to go into the brain find an area that I think represents subjective value, like we were just looking at, but maybe in the pure valuation areas, before choice ever happened. And then use that value signal to predict the choices people would later make. So that's an experiment <clears throat> that three, of my, three members of my lab did. Ifat Levy, who's now a professor at Yale, and Stephanie Lazaro and Rob Rutledge, who were then graduate students and are now uh, postdocs at University College London. <clears throat> 
what they did was a two-step fMRI experiment in humans. The first step was to identify brain areas that ought to encode value. And the way they did that was by running this very simple lottery task. Subject lies in the scanner for about 10 minutes. This lottery appears. It means you have a 50% chance of winning $2 and a 50% chance of losing $2. After a delay, we tell you which happened. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. We simply take the difference of the win versus lose. And we ask what areas in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex of you were highly active for win versus lose. Now, with that group of voxels, the group of brain areas in hand, this is what they look like across, averaged across a group of people. We're going to focus for today just on this one, this MPFC area. We can then go ahead and do a kind of weird backwards economic utility experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a group of 20 real consumer goods. And th these decisions that our subjects are going to be making are for real. Later on, we're going to ask them to choose. And one of their choices will be realized, and they'll go home with this consumer good. Here you can see we have some movies, some books, some stationery. We slide someone into the scanner. They stare straight ahead, and a, good, a consumer good appears. They look at it for four seconds, and it goes away. <laughs> this is a really dumb experiment. Another consumer good appears. This is a poster about this big of this Monet that they can take home. They've seen all these goods, so they know they're real. And then all I'm going to do is go into each one of the, I'm going to make tw uh, 20 of each of these measurements. I'm going to average them. So I'm going to say, what's the brain activation in this value area for each of these goods? So here's a typical NYU undergraduate, for better or worse. This is uh, his response to the Molsky notebook in the, ventri in the uh, medial prefrontal cortex. And alas, this is his response to a Beethoven CD. <laughs> now what we can do is we can order. This is going to be an ordinal exercise for the economists in the room. We can order by, neural acti by mean neural activation these 20 goods. So here's this kid. Here's the Molsky notebook, which, he, which his medial prefrontal cortex loves. The Beethoven CD, which his medial prefrontal cortex hates. The Dolly poster, which he hates. This is all very depressing, really. Um, <laughs> OK, this is Dodge, the movie Dodgeball, which I actually admit to liking, but you, know, you wouldn't want your brain to reveal that. Um, OK, so we, we generate this. Now we take them back into the lab. They're not in the scanner anymore. And what we're going to do next is simply have them make a series of choices. Which of these two would you rather have? And we'll show them lots of, we'll show them every possible pair twice and ask which would you rather have because this is going to allow us to construct a preference ordering. What's your behavioral preference? Now, the critical idea next is pretty complicated. So, and I want to do it fairly quickly because I still want to show you one other thing. The critical idea here is if two goods have really different neural activation, the highest and the lowest, we ought to be able to predict that dead on. If two goods are really close to each other in their neural activations, that ought to be pretty hard to predict. So what we'll do is we'll sort all the neural pairs, all the neural data into pairs, based on what we call their rank distance. The easiest ones are the 19 apart, and the hardest ones are the two apart. And we'll ask, how accurately can we predict at each rank distance across the 20 people in this study? This is a glass half empty, glass half full moment. Here are the 19 apart, and you can see we can get about 85 to 87% correct. Here's the one apart, and here you can see one, two, three, we're basically operating completely at chance. Now that's good, because the implication of the theory is, I mean, these are, for the economists, let me be clear, these are fully, if, if I'm right, these are fully cardinal measures of subjective value. So, that's great. Down here, I should be operating a chance because the random utility representation is highly overlapping here. Here, it should be, well, it should be at 100% at this point. Now, we've actually done more complicated analyses of these. Because we asked people to make each choice twice, we could ask whether they were consistent in their choice, whether sometimes they preferred the Monet and sometimes the Klimt, and sometimes the Klimt and sometimes the Monet and vice versa. <coughs> 
And we asked whether from the variance of the neural signal we could predict this indifference. And interestingly, we could not. We could only do that if we added to the standard random utility model a uh, measurement error term. And that measurement error term is sort of an aggregate measure of how badly the scanner samples this signal. And now, this is the bad news. This is really glass less than, this is glass 99% empty. Uh, the signal to noise ratio on these experiments is on order 30 to 1 in the wrong direction. So the scanners are terrible. They're terrible. Um, that's not to say your money is badly spent on a scanner, but, but they, they're the lowest signal to noise device on Earth. Okay, but what am I saying? What's the main point? Why did I tell you all of this? This is the thing I really want to drive home. We have this object in the because theories, the economic because theories, that we call subjective value. And of course it has a partner called expected subjective value. Subjective value is linearly proportional to utility when choosers are consistent in their behavior. When utility theory applies and tells us what the underlying representation should look like, the theory says subjective value signals should have the same properties. And this has now been done about 10 times in different labs using different techniques, and the answer is always yes. The uh, medial prefrontal cortex does clearly have the neural correlative utility. It can predict choice, and it's even causal if you disrupt it, if you increase it, if you decrease it, if you lesion it, you alter choice in fundamental ways predicted by the theory. So the critical idea I want to get across is that we can project the economic theory down into the nervous system, turning it into a because theory, and what we get out is something that makes a lot of sense. We have a network of areas involved in valuation. I haven't told you much about this, but they include the, we think, hippocampus. For sure, they include the amygdala, the ventral striatum, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the orbitofrontal cortex. We know something about how those areas go together, not a lot. They seem to produce a final common utility-like representation at the level of the medial prefrontal cortex. And I haven't told you much about this at the level of the ventral striatum. And that signal seems to be used by a parietal frontal network, which selects from that representation those objects in the current choice set, and then forces a winner-take-all argmax operation in order to extract the most highly valued of the options. What I want you to see this is a really hybrid theory. It has features of both of its parent theories. Now, at this point, it is perfectly reasonable for an economist in the audience to stop me and say, OK, I, I'm, the first time this happened to me, I, we just got to this stage. It was probably about ma of making this claim without so many good experiments. It was maybe eight years ago. I was at Dartmouth. It was in one of the many times Michael Gazanigo was actually a professor at Dartmouth. And he introduced me, and I gave this talk. One of the economists in the audience stood up and said, so you're telling us that we're right. I said, OK, well, that's kind of true. He said, OK, well, that's not news. I said, well, but it's in the brain. He said, yeah, but we're right. You actually haven't told me anything useful as an economist. Like, so what? OK, neurobiologists don't get it. I knew that. And, and he was right. The story I've told you really is a story about uniting two theories, but it's not a story that has particular impact on the way as economists we build models of how people choose. Now, I want to show you that that's not necessarily true. As we've come to understand this architecture better, we've come to understand computational features of it which change the way we think about decision making at the economic level. I'm going to just show you one example of that today, too quickly, but it's one that I'm particularly proud of, I have to say. And it's a study of representation in this area, parietal area LIP. So what I'm going to do is um, now stop for a moment and tell you a little bit about representation in the nervous system, because we actually, as, neur as neurobiologists, have lots of beautiful theories of representation in the nervous system. One of the most important theories of representation we have in the nervous system, which was developed, well, I guess originally probably by Hartline in the last century, but who we associate nowadays with the computational neurobiologist David Heeger, is something called the normalized representation. Heeger had this interesting insight. If we're recording from a single neuron in cortical area V1, that, oh, it fires when it sees a vertically oriented bar. That is to say, the action potential rate is proportional how big a vertically oriented bar is sitting in front of it. Its firing rate is actually higher if that vertical bar is surrounded by horizontal bars 
than if it's surrounded by other vertically oriented bars. It's as if the other vertically oriented bars somehow suppress this neuron's activity, and the horizontally oriented bars augment it. This was a huge puzzle for a long time. Heger recognized quite early on that this had, there were two implications of this. First, just in a completely ad hoc, arbitrary way, we could model these interactions using something that we nowadays call divisive normalization. What Heger argued was that the firing rate of the neuron reflected the goodness of fit, how close the stimulus was to the sensitivity of this neuron, but divided by the sum of the goodness of fit of all the adjacent neurons that have the same sensitivity. Let me say that a slightly different way. This neuron, its activity, which is the numerator, is being divided, or you can almost think of it as being subtracted away, the more the nearby guys are seeing the same thing. Okay? Now, why does that make sense? See, I think I'm going to try and do this super fast. <clears throat> He and Eros Simoncelli realized that it made sense because adjacent locations in visual space, in fact, tend to see the same thing. That's kind of obvious. If you have two little guys and they're looking at the same thing, if you know that the first guy sees a vertically oriented bar, you can probably guess that the second guy's looking at a vertically oriented bar. Let's take a more extreme case. A ring of six of these detectors with one in the center. If you know that all six see vertically oriented bars, it's extremely likely that the central one sees a vertically oriented bar. And what he realized was that that meant that the firing rate of that middle guy was redundant. He was wasting spikes to tell you something you already knew. In fact, what he ought to do is fire fewer spikes because you already know that there's probably a vertical bar there. He just needs to fire enough to tell you that it's what you expect. Of course, if it's not what you expect, he has to fire a lot of extra spikes to communicate that. And what Aero Simoncelli and his graduate student Odelia Schwartz proved was that the normative theory of visual encoding, which assumes that neurons and action potentials cost something to produce, suggests that the most efficient way to encode information about the visual world is to represent not simply what you see, but what you see divided by the stuff around it, and the division process reflects the statistical likelihood that you're seeing the same thing. So you'd actually want some Gaussian-like fall-off of correlation, which would reflect the fall-off in spatial correlation of real-world images that these animals really see in their real lives. Okay, so here's the critical idea. I'm skipping all this stuff. <clears throat> the critical idea is that an efficient cortical representation takes this form. The firing rate, this is just a constant, we're not going to worry about this, is something about what that neuron's looking at, plus a baseline firing rate for the neuron, this is the unique zero for the economist for this neuron, plus the sum of all the values of all the other stuff that's being compared to it. I'm going to really flesh this out in a moment. Plus this normalization constant, which actually controls curvature. We'll talk about that in a bit. OK, so translated into the language of LIP, I've been telling you that area LIP is a value representation area, that it represents subjective value. If that's true, then what I really should think is that the firing rate associated with object one in the choice set is actually how good object one is divided by how good everything else in the choice set is. It's the relative value of the thing you're looking at compared to the sum of all the things in the current choice sets. Now, we, we could go into this. Is a really, I can show you that this is a really efficient way to do this. One way to say this is it decorrelates the choice set. That's kind of interesting. But the critical idea here is that as we increase the number of neurons that we use to encode information about the choice set, we increase the cost of maintaining that representation. Here I've plotted cost as low here and high here. As we increase the number of neurons, we increase the accuracy with which we can encode information about the choice set. And when we use cortical normalization, 
we can bow this line out as far as we can, and that bowing reflects taking advantage of the statistical correlations in the choice sets that you've encountered in your life. And so it's the intersection of this metabolic cost constraint with this optimal encoding constraint, which identifies a unique point, which is the best encoding point. OK, I know that was complicated. I'm going to do two things now. The next thing I'm going to do is prove to you that this is actually what goes on in area LIP. And then we'll finish up. So to do that, Ken Wei Louie in my lab trained a monkey on this simple task. He's staring straight ahead. Three targets light up. One, two, three. All go off except one. He looks at that one, gets a reward. This target's always worth one unit of reward. This target's always worth half a unit. And this target's always worth two units. That allows us to construct seven different conditions for this neuron and this monkey. You're looking only at the unit reward, the unit reward divided by the unit reward plus a little reward, plus a big reward, plus both rewards, and then these weird situations where the value of the targets outside the response field are going up, but there's nothing in the response field. Of course, these are the ratios of value you extract. And this is what you get when you record from single neurons in area LIP. Here's the firing rate of the neuron when there's a target value 1 in the response field and no other target. Here's what happens when I turn on a second lower valued target. The firing rate goes down a little bit. A third lower valued target, both at once. And here are the same conditions where you can see increasing suppression for the uh, no target present case. OK, so this is by way of saying we now have really overwhelming evidence. There are now a few papers on this that say that the firing rates in area LIP have this weird normalization feature, which we have a normative theory to predict. Who cares? An economist has to care. And here's why an economist has to care. Now I want to remind all the economists in the room that um, these are Neurons, these are random utility objects. They have a mean firing rate with a variance. The mean and variance are related. As the mean firing rate drops, the variance drops, but not as fast as it should. That means that as mean firing rates drop, things get more confusable. It's a feature of every neuron that's ever been studied, uh, every cortical neuron that's ever been studied. The second thing I want to stress is that there's an additive noise term for the economist that's fixed that all these neurons have. OK, keep those in mind. Now let's imagine, this is a riff on Shina Yangar's famous too much choice experiment in the economics literature, the business literature. And here what I'm representing are three uh, jellies that a consumer might face. These are distributions of the internal utilities or firing rates. Let's make them firing rates that we would observe on different trials. This is the most likely value. These are extreme high and extreme low values from different encounters with this jelly. I present these three jellies, and I ask my subject, which do you prefer? Now, in a normalized system, we get this problem. As we begin to add other jellies or swiggle around the value of the low-valued jellies, they crush down these upper two distributions and crush them into each other. So the result is that mucking with these undesirable jellies in the choice set ought to produce more and more stochastic choice in our choosers, something that's never been observed. I'm really smoking here, I know. I apologize. Yeah, I'm going to even skip this. Blah, blah, blah. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. OK, so here's the experiment. I'm just going to show you the monkey one, because I'm so out of time. Um, here, here's the monkey's job. Find the good juice, find the good target, and get the juice. Target one is always going to be worth 0.156 milliliters of beriberi juice. Target two is going to range. Sometimes it'll be 0.13. You should pick this one. Sometimes it'll be 0.182. You should pick this one. Sometimes it'll be the same. This should produce a logic cho choice function. I'm going to do it under two conditions, or Kenway's going to do it under two conditions, when there's a very, very low value distractor and a medium low value distractor. The monkeys will never pick these distractors. They're crummy options. 
And here's what we find. So this is when the distractor is very, very low valued. You can see when they're the same rewards, V1 and V2, the monkey doesn't care, 50-50. When it's 0.182 versus 0.15, the monkey picks 0.182 about 90% of the time. He can find the right reward 90% of the time. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the low valued distractor, and we're going to increase its value slightly, not much, not enough to ever have it chosen. It may not be immediately obvious how huge an effect this is. This monkey has gone from being able to find the high-valued target 90% of the time to being able to find it only 60% of the time. It turns out this is robust. We can produce this in several monkeys, and we've now gotten it in humans as well, making consumer choices over candies. So here's my answer for an economist. What are you, what are you guys going to do for us? In the 19... 50s, Herb Simon argued that we ought, as economists, to take into account the costs of cortical computation, of, of cognitive computations, that people satisfice. But this is kind of hand waving at the time because we couldn't write out cost functions. We couldn't say what it costs to do a computation. We could just say, gosh, it would be neat if you could incorporate that. But now, neuroscience has got to a place where we can actually often write out normative theories of costs. That means that we can ask not what behavior did the person make that was efficient with regard to the choice set, but what behavior did the person make with regard to the choice set and the costs of the computation necessary to achieve efficient normalization, efficient transitivity. Thinking of it this way, these monkeys are violating rational choice. They're giving up juice. And the argument is they're giving up juice but not more than it would cost them neurobiologically to recover that juice. They're at the equilibrium point between the costs and the benefits of these two. Now, this is a very traditional economic idea, but it's, a, it's an idea we can really do now. You know, 50 years ago, this was just a dream when Simon said it. But this is the kind of thing that I think serious neuroeconomics makes possible. And it's this union, whether we're talking about in domains like learning theory, where there have been huge advances, or whether we're talking about domains like this, choice theory, that are really going to see the mating of these two disciplines and the importing of constraints back and forth across the disciplinary boundaries to achieve goals that are really central, I think, to both disciplines. I think that's what we really want to look forward to as these disciplines mature. Thank you. So we still have time for a couple of questions. Um, so if anybody has a question, please raise your hand and I will come over to you right here. So I'm particularly interested in some of the statements you made early on about the, I think your word was inevitability of this kind of reduction. Right? Um, and one person you didn't mention um, is Kahneman. So let's compare two kinds of reduction here. So the at the neurological level that you've been talking about. And I, mean, I think it's fair to characterize Kahneman's work as more at the cognitive level. I mean, it's more psychology. And to play devil's advocate and to prompt you, um, I would argue that Kahneman's work has had significant effects by the way in which economists go about their business. OK, so first, I mean, th that was, that's a great question. Gets at agreements and disagreements, right? So for those of you who aren't, don't know much about decision theory, um, Danny Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for work that he, he's a psychologist, it's work he did with his colleague Amos Tversky um, in Israel and at Stanford, and they really wrote the modern model for behavioral economics. They wrote the most predictive model for sort of general human behavior in decision making, and it's called prospect theory. <clears throat> it's a modification of standard expected utility theory that allows for things like subjective representation of probability. And it's been extremely impactful. Their paper in Econometrica in 1979, even though they're psychologists, is the most cited paper in economics that's not a methods paper, period. Now, when this sort of started 15 years ago, Danny was a huge advocate of neuroeconomics. Because Danny's view was that um, neuroeconomics would do exactly what we imagine it would do. It would have this reductive synthesis, 
and the reductive synthesis would align traditional economics, which he viewed as mostly busted, with their theories, including a distinction he later became very interested in, uh, what's called the two-system theory, the system one, system two, or fast and slow. He has a, a really fun new book about this theory. And that there'd be a neurobiological instantiation of this as well. And so he really worked to promote it. He wrote the uh, afterword for the first textbook, which I edited, in neuroeconomics. OK, so over, now read the next 10 years. The neurobiologists have been drifting away from this two-system view. The view of the neurobiologists is that that's not going to be reductively synthetic between economics and neuroscience, and that there is not strong neurobiological evidence for two systems. Now, let me be extremely clear here, because Danny and I get into fights about this all the time. When I show you that map of all those brain areas, there are a lot of systems there. So if Danny says, I think there are eight systems, I say, no, there are probably 50 that contribute to the construction of value, but that's not really what he means. He means that there are two completely independent decision-making modules in the human brain that have independent access to the motor control circuitry. One of them is a high-speed system. One of them is a low-speed system. One involves cortex. One involves something that's not the cortex. And I have to say that I just don't think that's right. I mean, I went in thinking that was right, but the neurobiology doesn't support that. Now, that's led me to go back to the psychology and ask how convinced I am that the psychology really supports fast and slow as opposed to gradient. Now, if I really push Danny on this, you know, you, the place where you can push me, you can say, well, stuff that's slow becomes fast with repetition. He says, yeah, that's true, but that's because the slow system passes it to the fast system. Well, how does it do that? Well, I'm a psychologist. OK, that's a fair answer. Um, I know, I mean, I'm asking a mechanistic algorithmic question. And he's like, I'm not a neurobiologist. Don't ask me a question like that. So there's no doubt about it that there's a touch of common ground here. This notion that there are multiple inputs. Danny's notion that there are two yous in your head that make decisions separately, that they compete in a sort of aggressive game theoretic sense to control your behavior, I just don't think the neurobiology is there. Now, the place this war was really fought was between my lab and John Cohen's lab. John is at Princeton and a colleague of, uh, of Danny's uh, over intertemporal choice, discounting. They published a very famous paper in which they argued that there were two systems involved, one that liked immediate rewards and one that, liked, that was patient and rational. And we published at exactly the same time, well, we published a couple years later, in fairness, a study that said the exact opposite. And you know, I, I've, I'll leave it to you to go read those papers and see which one you believe. I obviously believe mine. <laughs> I think that, for the most part, the view in the community right now is of some skepticism toward the two systems view. And I mean, I say that with all respect to Danny. He's been right more times than I've been right. He's, he's been right more times than I've been. So, uh, so I'm, I'm very cautious here, but I just don't see it in the neurobiology. And we have time for one more question. Hello. Um, I'd like to know, how does this apply to what makes a great poker player? Oh, that's too hard. Um, <laughs> I could answer that with regard to blackjack. Um, see, uh, uh, the nice thing about blackjack is, is for an economist, it's not a game. It's an optimization problem, right? Poker's a game because you have another player and you have to worry about his beliefs. Uh, let me answer it this way. About eight, nine years ago, uh, the neuroeconomic community got real interested in this distinction between blackjack and poker. In blackjack, the dealer is not your enemy, right? Everybody who's, some of you may not have actually spent as many hours as I playing these games. Uh, in blackjack, they just deal cards, and you have to decide whether you know hit or stay, and you're trying to get to 21. And knowing the size of the deck and the number of cards and the current distribution, blah, 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 it's just a math problem. And there's an optimal strategy, and you lose about 0.5% of the time. Um, poker, there's a guy sitting across from you, 
and he's screwing with you. He's trying to make you believe that he has some set of beliefs he doesn't have so that you'll act on those false beliefs. For an economist, this is the difference between a standard microeconomic optimization problem and a game in the sense that von Neumann and Morgenstern and later John Nash, who won the Nobel Prize, this is the guy from a beautiful mind, meant the word game. And so a lot of us got worried that games were different, that they actually might be played by different systems, and that the story I told you doesn't apply to playing poker because it, it really is a system about microeconomic optimization, not about gameplay. Now, a bunch of labs did experiments to show that that wasn't true. But the one, so I'll tell you about one we did. This was a postdoctoral fellow of mine at the time by the name of Michael Doris. Michael's a professor, um, well, he's a professor right now in Canada at Queen's University, but he's going to the Chinese Academy of Sciences to be the first Anglo professor there in Shanghai, which is pretty neat. Uh, and Michael, in any case, um, trained monkeys to play this game called Work or Shirk. You can just think of it as like rock, paper, scissors. And so the monkeys would play this game of Work or Shirk. Now what Nash proved and what he won the Nobel Prize for was showing this weird thing. Whenever you're at what's called a mixed strategy equilibrium, that is, sometimes I work, sometimes I shirk, sometimes I play rock, sometimes I play paper, sometimes I play scissors, you do that because the subjective values or the utilities, expected utilities, of all those options are exactly equal. If they are not exactly equal, you would never mix. You would pick the better one. And that's true even under circumstances when the game structure requires that you play rock 80% of the time and paper 20%. So it's not 50-50. Anything that's mixing always requires that the underlying expected values, expected utilities be exactly equal, even though the behaviors are not. And so we thought, oh, well, we'll go into area LIP. We'll record from these neurons and see whether they encode the behavior or whether they encoded the expected utilities, in which case they would ne nothing we could do that changed the behavior but left the equilibrium point alone would change the firing rates. And they followed the Nash theorem absolutely precisely. They looked exactly like the Nash theorem predicted they should during gameplay. Now, when we went at the data on a trial by trial basis in really careful detail, what we noticed was that the firing rates, although they were rock solid on average, actually fluctuated a little bit. And these fluctuations actually accounted for slight deviations of the monkey from 50-50. From it was as if the monkey was throwing dice, but that the physical throwing of the dice were these fluctuating spike rates once he was parked at the Nash equilibrium. So this, if anything, strengthened our conviction that the architecture I've just told you about is the same one for playing poker. And that makes good sense. From an economist's point of view, that's a natural. For a neurobiologist who read Descartes, that's troubling. Because Descartes told us that really complicated behaviors, like poker, ought to be a different thing. There are divine souls. And I think the evidence is, well, I'm not going to rule on whether there are divine souls, but they're the same thing that does the micro, the micro problems I've been showing you here today. So I think that the story really holds there. And I would lean you towards a bunch of these beautiful game theory papers by my lab and Dale Lee's lab are the two big labs that have done it. Thank you, Professor Glimpscher. And I would like to thank you all for coming. Thank you.